Good afternoon, everyone. This is Jamie Feinberg, Vice President of Risk Control for Captive Resources. I wanted to welcome you today to our third webinar in our webinar series. This is the growth of medical tourism through self-funded insurance. I'd like to welcome today our partners, um, the Medical Tourism Association. Our presenter today will be Jonathan Edelheit, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the Medical Tourism Association. Jonathan is a leader U.S. and international health care and considered one of the world's top experts. He has extensive experience in both U.S. and international health insurance and health care. Uh, Mr. Eidelheit has spent the past 12 years of his career dedicated to U.S. and international health care and health insurance issues and has received awards for being an international health care leader. Mr. Eidelheit is often requested to be a keynote speaker at international conferences and has spoken at over 50 U.S. and international health care conferences. With that, I am going to turn it over to Jonathan to take us through um, the presentation today. This session will be recorded and you will be able to get the link for all of our Well Health Insurance captive members. Um, you will be able to access the webinar recording link through the member portal on the Well Health website. Um, if you do need the um, information um, after the presentation, we will go ahead and send that out to anybody else who does request the, the link. With that, I will turn it over to Jonathan, um, and we welcome you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me, Jamie, and I appreciate it. Look, uh, really excited to do this webcast with uh, Captive Resources. Um, and really covering what's going on in medical tourism and the trends going forward. And also, just to give everyone, uh, you know, some background is, uh, you know, my background is running a national TPA, um, and I was the first person to implement medical tourism into self-funded and fully insured plans back in the uh, early to mid-2000s. So I understand kind of the issues, the challenges, and what needs to be done right, and kind of come from the perspective uh, come from the perspective of, um, you know, being from, you know, the, the reinsurance and stop loss and self-funding world. So, obviously, you know, if we really get into it, you know, we all know, you know, healthcare costs are increasing significantly. Um, we know they're not going down. You know, in 2003, um, you know, if you look at the worker contribution and the employer contribution combined, it was almost $9,000. Uh, where last uh, year it was, uh, you know, over $16,000, which is an 80% total premium increase. Um, and, and, and that, you know, those numbers are continuing to grow every single year. And, and looking at another chart um, from Kaiser, 22 years ago, single premiums were almost $1,500, where in 2013 there were almost 6000 And it's, they're anticipated to double in the next 10 years. So that also means the, the rate of inflation and the rate of premium increases is, is moving much faster than it did over the past two decades. You know, the family cost used to be about $4,000 22 years ago, and it's $16,000 as of last year, but it's actually expected to quadruple, so grow four times. So if we look at that, that thing by, you know, Kaiser's expecting by um, 2023, that you're looking at a family premium of close to $60,000. Um, and we hope by then the Cadillac tax has been repealed because that means that almost everyone is going to be hit with the Cadillac tax and an additional 40% um, penalty. Um, and obviously, you know, you know, I'm sure everyone's quite in tune with the Affordable Care Act, um, and I also get involved in a lot of uh, education in, re in regards to health care reform and we'll work closely even with um, HHS, DOL, and IRS on the ACA side. And, um, you know, the guarantee issue, the no pre ex removal of lifetime or annual maximums, there are all positives to it, but at the end of the day, that increases the cost, and that's not going to bring the costs, um, you know, down for health care reform. And then you've got certain things under the Affordable Care Act, which is going to make um, innovation and things like medical tourism even more attractive, you know, such as the senior citizens, you know, being charged three to one when they really should be charged five to six times the rate of a younger person. So younger people are starting to subsidize um, the older people. And then what, what you're starting to see is, you know, especially even in the exchanges, is the younger people not buying into the exchange, so having more of the sick and older, so the cost going up in the exchange. So because of this, and rising costs with the Affordable Care Act, 
you know, what we're seeing is a lot of disruption in the industry and, and a change in focus on innovation. Um, and I have, a, I have a lot of, uh, you know, friends who are senior execs at some of the big carriers, you know, and for the first time ever, you know, they're telling me how the word innovation is being talked about within the insurance company. And it's because they realize that premiums are no longer sustainable and unless they start getting aggressive, um, that, you know, the cost will not be affordable anymore and, you know, they won't be able to collect the premium that they used to. So they're really looking at what do we do to really lower costs. And if you look at what, what, what has a really big impact on making health care affordable, um, you could look at uh, high deductible plans, but they've been tried and it's not containing costs. Consumer driven plans have been tried and really aren't containing costs. You could implement corporate wellness programs. Um, but corporate wellness programs can take a couple years to really get underway. And, you know, it depends on who, who, who's the vendor you're using, what programs, um, you know, and then there's the question surrounding, you know, being able to measure it and ROI. So medical tourism is really one of the only things um, that actually has a, you know, um, you know, hard dollar savings. If someone actually goes and travels for medical tourism, there is savings. It's not theoretical. There's no... Um, long-term ROI that you have to measure or for a long period of time um, for it to kick in, it's, it's immediate and it's very transparent. So there's two types of medical tourism. There's domestic and there's international. And domestic um, is going to be something I think in the next one to two years you'll see in most, most uh, uh, self-funded plans across the country. Um, so it's already been adopted by most of the large employers and that is um, you know, letting a patient travel from one city within the United States to another city for a non-emergency non procedure. Um, so, uh, you know, you have uh, Walmart, Stunted, Boeing, Lowe's, Pepsi, um, and there's a lot of other big employers following suit. And the whole, there's two different philosophies, um, or, or, or I would say classes of domestic medical tourism. There's one where you're sending them to a city that, um, and, and a hospital that has excellent care, but maybe it's not a top tier city in the U.S. And, you know, maybe the facility is not known as the best in the U.S., but it has a very high, uh, very high quality care, but the cost is still 50 to 90 percent less. So you might have a knee replacement or a hip replacement that could be 50 to 60 thousand dollars in the U.S. Um, but they can try, and you might be living in Los Angeles, but you can travel to Oklahoma. And in Oklahoma, you might find that surgery actually costs 20000 or 15000 or $30,000. So quite significant savings. And some of the surgeons at these facilities are, you know, uh, there's one in Orange County, California, where the actual surgeon is the one who designs the implants for Johnson & Johnson. Um, so really high quality care. And then, um, you know, the other school of or class of domestic medical tourism would be similar to the ones that like Lowe's has done with Cleveland Clinic, where you're partnering with one of the top hospitals in the U.S., but they have um, set bundled pricing that includes the cost of complications for a procedure. So you know going in, if I'm sending an employee for a heart procedure, my cost all in is $120,000 and I don't have to worry about anything else. And it's all based upon what's called the multidisciplinary approach to care where the hospital gets everyone who's working, touching that patient, all working together in a circle. Um, where normally a lot of times they'll all work independently in silos. And then the multidisciplinary team knows that if anything goes wrong, that they don't get extra, they, you know, they don't get extra money for it. If the surgeon has to do the surgery again, because of a complication, they don't get paid. Same thing with the anesthesiologist. So everyone works together as a team to make sure everything gets done right. And what they're finding is that the actual costs are less um, than if patients are going to their own local hospitals and the recovery time is less and the employees turning to work faster. So they're finding multiple ROIs from it and they realize that this is what they need to focus on um, going forward. Uh, but both of them are, are very heavily focused on the whole transparency of bundled pricing. Because right now, as you know, um, it's impossible to really know what your price is. 
Um, you know, it depends upon what zip code you're in, you know, the, you know, what hospital, one hospital across the street from another could have a totally different price, and then it determines, you know, you don't know what surgeon it is, and then that's still just an estimate of what you think you might get charged by that hospital. Where with medical tourism, whether it's domestic or international, you know ahead of time what your actual cost is. So you're actually really able to budget and forecast with your plan. So the other side of the coin is international medical tourism. And that's a pay, you know, uh, employees or members and patients traveling to another country for care. So international medical tourism is something I think, um, you know, it's been going on for quite a while. I was doing it in the early 2000s. Um, you know, with, with success, but I think over the next couple of years you're going to see this as also a common benefit in most, um, most plans. Um, and, and therefore, you know, if you're on this call, I, I really feel, I mean, you know, once you go through this, my, uh, once I finish my presentation, I think you'll have a much um, uh, better understanding, but I think that you're going to see that this is something that you should really get in front of um, and be, be on top of. Um, ahead of time. And by the way, if anyone has any questions, um, you know, please, uh, you know, please feel free during it if you'd like, you know, if you'd like to, you know, uh, to ask it and potentially if it's on point with what I'm talking about, um, I can answer it. If not, um, I'll let Jamie field uh, and moderate those questions later. So, you know, obviously everyone on this call really knows what self-funding is. Um, and obviously, you know, we know self-funding is growing much faster than fully insured plans. Um, you know, because of uh, some of the advantages of uh, things that you don't have to cover um, that the fully insured plans do. And I think that um, whether it's certain benefits or certain taxes and pooling charges, um, you know, that advantage is going to increase. And we're starting to see, you know, more and more groups, um, you know, self-fund. Uh, and I think those statistics are, are really amazing when you look at it. Um, you know, it's like 83% with 200 or more workers are, um, you know, self-funded. And, you know, in anticipation, you know, before the ACA was passed, 6% of fully insured companies were looking at self-funding specifically because of the Affordable Care Act. And I think that you'll see that increase. And by 2016, you know, it's estimated that for employers with over 5,000 lives, 97.4% um, of them are going to be self-funded. Um, and the beauty of self-funding with medical tourism is if you want to do it, it's something that you can do instantly. You don't have the compliance or the bureaucracy issues. You put in a um, you put in a uh, you know an amendment to your summary plan descriptions. Um, uh, you know you let your employees know, and you basically educate your employees, and you roll it out. So you know there could be some people on this call that you know aren't that familiar with self-funding, although most of the people are. So I'll just run really quickly to some of those core elements that really apply to medical tourism. So obviously, if you're self-funded, you, you know, the risk is on the employer, but you'll buy that stop-loss coverage and get a specific deductible on each employee, which is going to limit the liability that, you know, the, uh, the employer has to a cap. So let's say, for example, for sake of this PowerPoint and presentation, we're talking about an employer that has a stop-loss deductible of $100,000, meaning that the employer has to pay the first $100,000, and then once they hit that $100,000, then the, um, the stop-loss carrier pays the balance. Um, so in that event, and, you know, medical tourism is a huge advantage because now you're talking about um, most procedures, depending on where you're going overseas, they're going to be significantly less than $100,000. So any employer that implements medical tourism is going to, when they get employees to travel, immediately be putting money in their pockets. And I'll be doing some case studies of employers who are doing medical tourism. So as I'm going through this presentation, don't think this is theory or this is, you know, something that may happen in the future. It's happening and happening really successfully for some employers. And so if you have that stop-loss deductible, and then let's say you, you, you have your aggregate, which is your worst-case scenario across the whole plan for the year, the one thing you have to think about is implementing medical tourism and lowering your costs for procedures it's not just about putting money in the employer's pocket and saving yourself money. Also think about the fact on future um, premium increases from the reinsurance carrier. If you could potentially eliminate or get close to eliminating stop-loss claims coming in for your reinsurance company, and that means not only are your claims going to be less and your, your, your um, health insurance 
going forward going to be uh, less, but your renewals from the reinsurance carrier are going to be significantly less in the future because you're actually lowering costs. Um, so what services do medical, medical tourists speak? Uh, I'm not sorry, speak, seek. So orthopedics, hip, knees, back, spine, um, cancer treatment. You know, if you ask, you know, who, who is traveling for medical tourism, I always like to throw out some really famous names. Um, you've got um, Steve Jobs from Apple. He's a medical tourist. Um, you're talking about someone who has enough money that he could have bought the Cleveland Clinic or the Mayo Clinic and had it moved to his backyard. But he actually went over to Europe for cancer, uh, cancer treatment. Uh, Peyton Manning, the football player, Farrah Fawcett, um, all three went to Europe for cancer. Um, you know, so, you know, famous people, people with money and means and, and, um, and access are willing to travel. Um, heart procedures, transplants, um, uh, dental. So if you're talking about self-funded dental, that's going to be a big area of growth going forward, dental implants, because you're talking about, you know, you know, 90 percent less for dental implants, which are extremely expensive. And obviously with the caps on dental, um, the annual max on the dental care of about 1000 to $2,000 sometimes, that won't even cover the cost of one implant here in the U.S., but it'll cover multiple implants overseas. Um, bariatric surgery, you know, obviously since the MA, uh, AMA um, ruled that obesity um, was a disease, um, you know, you're going to see a tremendous amount more of, of activity for bariatric surgery under self-funded plans, and this is the perfect area that, you know, a patient can tra travel for medical tourism for. Um, and then you've got, you know, things that, um, you know, may or may not be covered by the plan, depending on the plan. Um, you know, it's, we've seen some self-funded plans that actually cover cosmetic care, um, obviously infertility, depending on the plan, and these are all things that you can travel for, and even rehabilitation. Um, so uh, to look at, you know, potential costs for medical tourism for destinations. Um, you know, this is an example, and, and once again, I already, I already kind of went over in the U.S. It's very difficult to know what the price is. Um, you know, at, at that hospital. So, you know, a heart procedure that could be over $100,000, you know, might be as little as 15000 in Colombia, almost 6000 in India, 25000 in Costa Rica. Um, so a very significant cost reduction. And also, if you're traveling, it doesn't mean you're not going to a good doctor. The doctor may have actually practiced at the Cleveland Clinic and may actually, you know, still be an American Board Certified Surgeon. Um, because you've got a lot of doctors that come to train here, practice in U.S. hospitals, and then go back home for care. So looking back at that knee replacement, 50000 uh, potentially here in the U.S., 6500 in Colombia, almost 12000 in Costa Rica, um, and close to $6,200 uh, $6, in India. So very significant um, uh, discount. And you're talking about, in many cases, the same knee implant that you would get here in the U.S. Um, so there's a huge cost differential um, for, for this. And, um, and also looking at, at costs, I mean, the chart on the left shows, you know, what's the difference in cost uh, relative to the U.S. So Brazil, about 40 to 50 percent um, of what the U.S. cost is. Costa Rica, about 30 to 40 percent. India is about 20 percent of the cost of what the U.S. is. Mexico, about 25 to 35 percent of what um, the U.S. health care costs are. But the chart on the right, I think, is the most fascinating. So you'll have a lot of people who, you know, you're, who could be, you know, an HR executive or an insurance, uh, insurance agent or someone who's involved in making that decision on implementing medical tourism. And, and the reality is a lot of them, um, you know, could be just like me. So a Caucasian white person who is not of multicultural descent and, and, and has, you know, a good salary, and, um, uh, you know, very good benefits. And so, and, and if, if, you know, for everyone on this call, you're in the industry. You're in the benefits and insurance industry. So you know what good hospitals are, and a lot of times you know how to access those good hospitals and doctors. And so you might determine yourself personally, ah, I don't think I'd want to travel overseas. I'd prefer to go to either this top doctor I know locally or this top hospital somewhere in the country. And what you don't set yourself aside and say, 
let me put, put myself in the shoes of the normal employee, and that normal employee may not have that kind of access or information. Um, and also, they may have deductibles and coinsurance and copays that they otherwise, um, uh, you know, really can't afford. And so, what medical tourism does, whether it's domestic or international, is it waives the deductible and coinsurance and copays for the employees. And then what it does is it covers their travel expenses for the patient and a companion. And it also, um, in many cases, will go ahead and they'll give the employee an incentive. And that could be a percentage of savings or it could be a cash incentive. Um, so I believe, and, and I'll, I'll check um, uh, with my media manager um, who's uh, on this call too to see if he'll be able to, at the end, play a video. Um, you know, we have a CBS News video and there's an ABC one, which actually shows an employer who did medical tourism, and then it shows the employee's experience. And, you know, what you'll see when I go into one of those case studies in, in a few minutes is actually that waiving of a deductible and coinsurance and putting some money in that employee's pocket, it, it's a huge incentive, and it really means a, a, a lot to the employees. Um, so another example I'd like to go into, and I just did this, um, uh, I just did a webcast on this yesterday. So I, I don't know if any of you are familiar with, with uh, Sovaldi. Uh, it's by the pharmaceutical manufacturer Gilead. Um, it's the new cure for hepatitis C. Um, so it really is like a miracle cure. There's a lot of people affected by hepatitis C. It's going to be a major expense for um, every self-funded plan. And there's going to be an 800, 1,800% um, increase in the cost for self-funded plans um, in hepatitis C by 2016 just for this drug. And it's because there's going to be a huge curve over the next 12 to 24 months as everybody who has hepatitis C goes ahead and um, tries to get this drug to get their hepatitis C cured, which could cost hundreds of thousands of dollars otherwise without the drug. And, and they're going to be doing it because they, they know there's a 98% cure rate. And the treatment actually costs $1,000 per pill. And it, for a 12-week treatment, it's 84000 If you actually combine it, which is sometimes recommended by your doctor, with the other hepatitis drug called Elysio, um, which increases your success chance, it's 140000 If you go beyond the 12-week treatment and you have genotype 3, which is a 24 week treatment and it's combined with Elysio, you're talking about potentially close to $300,000 in expenses for this hepatitis C jar. And there's really not a lot that plans can do to stop it because it's a cure and people are going to want it. So what are the costs of Sovaldi in other countries? So in Canada, it's $55,000, um, you know, compared to $84,000 in the U.S. In the U.K., it's to $7,000. In Germany, $66,000. In Egypt, less than $900, and in Brazil, less than $900, and the same in India. So that is a major difference in price. Um, and with that, in the first year of sales just in the U.S., Gilead is going to recover all its research and development costs in producing the Savaldi drug. And AbbVie and several other pharmaceutical companies are coming out with their competitors this is all be soon, so you're going to have some other very expensive um, medications. And this is the start of a lot of expensive biologics and specialty drugs that are coming out in the near future that are going to crush self-funded plans. But the reality is, if you implement medical tourism, you can have a medical tourist go to another country for that hepatitis C treatment with Sovaldi or another medication. And that's something that the Medical Tourism Association can actually even help you uh, put together for you. Um, and that, that is quite significant, the savings. And to tell somebody, hey, we're going to send you on a vacation, you know, to Brazil or to India, you know, for a week, and you're going to get your, your treatment for hepatitis C, even if you're saying, I'm going to send you for four weeks, um, you know, for treatment, the savings is going to be substantial. You're still talking about, you know, saving anywhere from fifty to $60,000 or more for each person who goes through that Sovaldi treatment. Um, and, and I know insurance companies are extremely um, stressed out right now because they know this is going to be a massive hit. And then um, the federal government and state governments are really um, nervous about it too because 
in the states, um, I don't have the charts in this presentation, but you're talking about in some states, it, you, they, if you spread the, the cost of it out to every person living in that state who's a resident, it's like $200, $250 per person just to be able to cover the expense of treating people who have hepatitis C with that. Um, and I think and well, the other part of it, I, I, I'm also, I think, it's, it, I'm so excited for this treatment to come out because um, I, I have friends and, you know, colleagues I know who have hepatitis C and, you know, it's eventually debilitating disease, um, you know, that didn't, you know, that was, a, you know, had a much lesser cure rate. It could have been, you know, lower to 50% for some people and now knowing that they can be cured of it, it it's in the long term going to have a very positive effect on health care expenses uh, going forward. Um, but the next two years, everyone's going to take a huge hit from it. But you don't actually have to take a hit. You could have actually have a double win um, by using medical tourism. Jonathan, we had a question come up, if you don't mind me interrupting. Sure. Um, so we had a question in regards to the um, acute hepatitis C, and they're looking for kind of a prevalence, um, how, you know, how common is it in the United States, and, and also they're looking for some information regarding you know, how likely is um, how likely is it that acute Hep C will become a chronic condition for people? Um, can you re re repeat that last part regarding um, the chronic condition? Sure. They they were looking for information on how likely is it that acute hepatitis C will become a chronic condition. Uh, yes. Um, what I can do is um, I know I have that on my other PowerPoint. The exact figures. Um, okay. that we just got updated, so I'm going to try to get my, um, my uh, media manager to try to pull those up, um, and then once I get it from him, I will try to provide it. And if, if, if for some reason he can't get it in time, then what we can do is maybe we'll, um, you know, send that response out to everyone. Um, but I know that with this, um, that, uh, you know, with this, one of the challenges are I know some of the insurers are trying to say that they're going to, um, uh, limit it and only allow it for people who are chronic or who are acute. Um, and I think the problem with that is that you're going to have a lot of pushback from that, from people who have it and then even hiring attorneys and firing class action. So I think in the future, um, you know, you're going to see where they're going to have to provide it even for people who aren't acute. Um, and then also there's the option of, you know, if they're if they're trying to, as a carrier or as a stop loss carrier, self funded employer, say we're only going to provide it um, for people who are chronic or acute, you could always give them the option of going abroad for medical tourism voluntarily, taking vacation time, and then um, you, as the you know the plan sponsor, um, covering it uh, you know covering it uh, that way with the with the lower costs. Um, so also, um, let me. Uh, there's about three million people who are affected with hepatitis C here in the U.S., um, and there's about 750,000 that are Medicaid patients. But those mainly, um, a lot of those include prisoners, um, and that's unfortunately one thing for the states is I don't think they'll be sending their prisoners um, abroad to get their hepatitis C treatment. Um, so, okay, so uh, moving on um, to medical tourism benefits for employees. Um, so I already mentioned some of the benefits um, of care is there's no out-of-pocket expenses or co-pays. Um, you know, everything is, is, uh, is fully covered, and a lot of times there's, um, uh, there's no, uh, no wait periods. So uh, I'd like to do, so go over one case study with medical tourism. So um, there's an, a medical tourism association member um, which is HSM. Um, they're a manufacturing company out of North Carolina. And uh, we worked with, uh, our association worked for a couple months with Diane Sawyer and the Nightline team of ABC News to put together this case study. And it's really the first case study of a U.S. employer willing to go on record saying we've been doing international medical tourism for years. Um, so with HSM, um, they sent uh, two employees abroad um, uh, for medical tourism and HSM, the numbers the numbers aren't in here, um, but but I'll tell you uh, them verbally. Is for uh, they've been sending patients abroad to India and Costa Rica for five years, and they sent 250 employees abroad, and they saved 10 million dollars. And 
I think that number is, is, is huge, and it's a, it's, a, it's a great case study because what it shows is it's not a one-off. It's not a, it wasn't a pilot project. It wasn't something uh, some people were interested. You're talking about 250 employees over five years, you know, successful outcomes. They waived, in that case, they waived deductibles, co-insurance, co-pays, paid travel expenses, and gave people either $2,500 or 20% of the savings of what the employer saved. And what they've actually done is they've now created a corporate culture where everyone loves, loves the medical tourism program and everybody wants to actually travel for surgery. And I think this year they have something like 100 to 150 employees in the queue to potentially go overseas for surgery. So it's really changed everything around. But with the, with this, um, with the, the Nightline story we put together, um, it followed two employees going to Costa Rica. One went for a knee replacement that was going to cost about 60000 in the U.S. They got for about 23000 And one went for a gastric sleeve uh, surgery that would have cost 30000 in the U.S. that cost 17000 including all the expenses. So the employer, HSM, saved almost $50,000 for the over these two procedures. So it really had a big savings to the employer. Now, if I go back and jump into domestic medical tourism, and I use the Walmart story as an example, um, you know, because Walmart's a big advocate of domestic medical tourism. They did it for a couple reasons. They did it because they wanted to improve the quality of care for their Walmart employees. They wanted to make sure they ensured the right care at the right time, and that part is really important. One of the most amazing things about what's going on with medical tourism is the whole thing about, um, you know, the right diagnosis and misdiagnosis. There is so much money wasted with misdiagnosis and also with surgeons performing surgeries that are not required or not medically appropriate or there's an alternative, less invasive treatment. So all the employers who have implemented medical tourism, whether it's domestic or international, because it's a top hospital and a top surgeon, they're finding actually a very significant amount of the cases being referred over, being denied, meaning the surgeon is saying this surgery doesn't need to be performed or this is alternative treatment. Um, and that's ensuring the right care at the right time. That in and of itself is huge because it's almost like the medical tourism program becomes like a second diagnosis. Um, and, that, and that really that, that um, safety net which catches the employee um, from what the local surgeon or provider has recommended. Um, the other reason their, their Walmart uh, did it was a higher value and a lower cost for the company, and that meant they're getting um, you know better results and improved short and long-term financial man management of the plan, so the dollars, meaning that it was the cost was transparent and Walmart knows what the cost is, so they can really plan and manage their, their benefits much better. Um, so uh, Walmart built their center of excellence model, medical tourism. It's vo it was voluntary, meaning employees make the choice of whether they want to go and travel for care or not. Um, the consultation at the center of excellence is 100% paid, no deductible or coinsurance. Everything's covered, travel, lodging for the food, the patient, and a caregiver. Um, and Walmart created criteria as to what facilities they chose for, um, for the, their medical tourism program. And first, it was high-cost procedures, because it did make sense um, to, send, to let people travel for low-cost procedures, a procedure that had high variability in cost. And that meant you know, they're getting charged you know, 100000 in Atlanta for the heart procedure, 170000 in LA, 60000 in Oklahoma. And where they say there's a lot of variability, and we want to eliminate that variability and have one set cost that we know we can budget for. Um, and then uh, a hospital that has evidence-based medicine standards that are published. Um, and obviously one of the most important ones is where travel is possible but not urgent. You know, so it's not like someone's having a heart attack and you're saying, let's get this person on the plane and out to a facility. It's things that can be planned out. And so Walmart specifically chose cardiac and spine surgeries that they would use for their medical tourism program. Um, and they chose for cardiac procedures, Cleveland Clinic, Geisinger, Scott & White, Virginia Mason, for spine, Mercy Hospital, Scott & White, um, and Virginia Mason. And their projection is to save their, you know, they're going to save their employees five to $12,000 in out-of-pocket expenses through the program. Um, now, if we jump back into an international medical tourism example, um, you know, there's Blue Lake Casino and Hotel. 
um, which is a member of our the Medical Tourism Association. And they have a corporate culture that optimizes wellness, coordinated care, and cost reduction. Um, and they have, you know, medical, dental, vision, pharmaceutical, wellness in their self-funded plan. And they added medical tourism a couple of years ago for their 370 employees and their dependents. Um, and, you know, we just coordinated a CBS News um, coverage uh, that came out last week where uh, Blue Lake Casino sent Bruce Ryan, who's a 59-year-old construction manager, uh, to France to one of our members uh, for surgery. And it was, uh, he was a 59-year-old construction manager from California. Um, he went for rotator cuff at uh, Clinique de la Union um, in France. And they ended up having a 21-day trip where he brought his wife. They had a great successful surgery, post-op recovery, aftercare. They got sightseeing excursions in the mountains. And it was 50% off the cost. So his employer um, you know, saved 50% off the $32,000 um, that it would have cost in the U.S. And, you know, and so it was a really win-win. And, and one of the things, too, along with this is patients are able to enjoy a vacation when they do medical tourism, depending on what it is. Um, you know, people are going to get a knee replacement and going on a wave runner. Um, they're doing what the doctor recommends as tourism. And that could be as simple as eating out at a restaurant, going shopping, um, you know, in local stores or malls. And you literally 90, 95% of anyone who travels, whether it's a domestic medical tourist or an international medical tourist, you know, our research and our study system, they're all engaging in some form of tourism. So the people enjoy traveling to another destination and engaging in what that local city has to do, whether it's going to another U.S. city or going to another country in another part of the world. So some other examples is Lowe's in 2010 partnered with the Cleveland Clinic for cardiac procedures. Um, and, you know, they rolled that out where their employees could start going to Cleveland Clinic and they recommended that they go there. In 2011, um, Pepsi partnered with Johns Hopkins in Baltimore for cardiac and complex joint replacement surgeries. Um, so, you know, medical tourism is here. It's not going anywhere. It's not a fluke. It's not some random trend. It's something that you're going to see across the board. And, um, you know, if you look on the multicultural side, uh, you know, it's something like 55% of Asian Americans said they say well, they will travel abroad for medical tourism. Um, and it's almost 55% of Hispanic Americans say they would travel abroad for medical tourism. Um, and we're now a multicultural society here in the U.S. Um, where now, you know, babies being born, Caucasian babies, white babies are in the minority. Um, and when you deal with someone of a multicultural descent, a lot of times there's no cultural barrier, there's no language barrier, and there's no quality obstacles or, or, or learning curve. Meaning, if somebody has Colombian descent, they know the hospitals in Bogota, Colombia, or Medellin, Colombia, have amazing care. Um, uh, you know, if they're of Filipino descent or Indian descent, um, you know, if I'm of Mexican descent, I know where I'm from in Mexico, like Mexico City, they have amazing hospitals that are accredited. Um, and, you know, and this is a big area that I think has been missed in, um, in the industry. So one of the most important parts is really streamlining your international patient program, whether it's international or domestic. And that's implementing a technology platform. So if you're going to do medical tourism, you don't just roll it out. You don't just say, okay, now we have it today. So one, you need to focus heavily on how are you going to educate and engage the employees and the people who are covered by the plan. And this is where 90% of self-funded plans will go wrong because they don't know how to communicate or educate. And if you don't educate and convince the plan members about the quality of the healthcare overseas and the doctor and, and get them to believe in that healthcare trust, they're never going to get on a plane and travel to another city or another country for care. So there's a whole education and engagement platform that you really need to implement. Otherwise, you simply will never get utilization. And we've seen, we've seen it where employers implement medical tourism um, and, and, and whoever they're partnered with provides nothing at all for the employees but a one-page brochure, and they hope that just because they're telling someone you will waive your deductible and co-insurance and co-pays and give you some cash uh, and send you on a trip, that people are just going to sign up for it, and, and they're not. You know, I, I put myself in the shoes of, of anyone you know, any employee, I want to know how good is that doctor? How good is that hospital? Why should I get on the plane? You know, what's the outcome going to be like? What's the experience going to be like? 
So along with that, if you need some kind of technology solution, and you need to be HIPAA compliant. Um, so right now, there's a lot of medical tourism programs that are out there in the industry, and none of them are HIPAA compliant. And the reason why I say that is because we deal with all the hospitals, all the governments. You know, we, we, we work in over 100 different countries. Um, you know, we, uh, we work with all the hospitals, all the governments, all the insurance companies, the employers, the facilitators, um, everyone in the industry. Um, we reach almost 1 million HR, healthcare, and insurance execs, uh, you know, around the world. We got about half a million people in 30 groups in LinkedIn. You know, we're really influential in the HR and healthcare uh, sector. And we just know from dealing with everyone, you, you'll see that this part is really, really missing. So a lot of people tell, you know, a patient, you know, send your information over in Dropbox or send me an email in Outlook. So almost a lot of the programs are being managed in Microsoft Excel, um, Microsoft uh, Office, Outlook, and paper and pen. And this is a big problem because, um, you know, the Affordable Care Act is, you know, it's underfunded and it's being funded through fines. So employer fines and also HIPAA violation fines. And, and the HHS is getting very, um, you know, very aggressive with fines and they're hitting employers right now with $1 million fines for violating HIPAA. Um, so this is one of the most important parts that you really need to make sure is in place, and it's and it's not about taking someone's word. It's actually, you know, you know, really demoing the system, and then making sure that everyone who is attached to the system actually is using the system, even the hospital, um, because a lot of times people are just using like a Salesforce or a CRM to manage the process. So. What would an ideal technology system look like for, for domestic or international medical tourism? You know, you're going to have something where patients can communicate, they can do research about the doctor, the hospital, they can send, you know, inquiries to the doctor, to the hospital about the procedure, they can transfer their medical record in a secure format. Um, you know, everyone's, everything's got firewalls, security, it's safe harbor certified, it's certified as HIPAA compliant, and it's got an SSL. Um, and with it, you can have a whole ecosystem of multiple hospitals, um, you know, and videos and other engagement things on there where employees can go and really learn about the options. Um, and the multiple hospitals is important because whether you're implementing domestic or international medical tourism, my advice is always give, it's always good to give employees multiple options and not just one option. So, you know, someone might not want to go to the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland for, for care. Um, maybe they're on the West Coast and don't want to come over. Um, so you need to give a couple options. You know, if you if you told someone of Indian descent you're going to force them to go to Mexico for medical tourism, they might say, no, I don't want to go to Mexico for medical tourism. I want to go back to India. Um, so you got to give people options because everyone makes choices of where they want to go based on their own value system, um, and that, that really varies. So, the, you know, the communication between the doctor and the patient should all happen um, you know, directly through the system, not through email or any other format. Um, and, and this is actually, some of these slides are from a medical tourism system called um, Global Patient Management System. Um, you can do, you can actually have uh, one important thing, the last slide on this is getting electronic consent at the time of receiving data records. So a lot of the consents for getting the data, HIPAA privacy, and also consents for surgery can begin all through the system. So it's elect electrically uh, tracked. Okay, and as I was saying before, is you can have everything online where, you know, as an employer, you can have the hospital details, testimonials of patients, physician res uh, resumes, videos of doctors talking to patients. Um, the platform could have a telemedicine option through it, so that what can happen is when the patient travels, they can actually talk through video through the system to their, uh, to their home doctor. And they also can, when they go back home afterwards, whether it was a doctor from another city or another country, they can continue to have the continuum of care from actually um, through the telemedicine with the doctor um, versus just going and, and not being able to really communicate except through email. Um, you can preload all the medical conditions, you know, um, into, the, into the thing so that people can learn about what their condition is and what needs to be done to treat it. Um, and I think one of, the, um, one of the most important things in here is, I'm going to really skip the slides to the, uh, to the reporting section. Oh, well, let's look at this one for the user management. So you can provide different access. So, you know, HR can have, um, you know, certain access and only see certain information. 
So your benefits department or if you're a TPA or reinsurer, you can look at you know, who's traveling right now for medical tourism or what's scheduled in the queue. So you can really vet what, what the savings is, what's coming up, um, and then know where your program is going. So um, this, is a, this is just a sample screenshot of giving you an idea of, uh, you know, it could be customized for an employer with a video of the hospital and other information for the employees to read about. So I think one of the other key aspects is reporting. Um, if you're an employer, if you're a CPA, if you're a reinsurance company, um, an employer, you want to look at who's traveling, where they went for care, what the cost savings is. You want to know how long they were gone for, all the issues, anything surrounding that, that program. Um, and then that allows you to make intelligent decisions about how your program is doing, areas of improvement or areas to expand it. And I think so that reporting is great. I mean, where you look, oh, we had five employees go to new, for knee replacements to this facility, um, you know, and they had very positive experiences with no complications. So this is where we want to send people for knee replacements. Um, or at this facility, they're returning to work faster and the recovery time is less. Or, hey, you know, um, you know this facility uh, isn't responding, this hospital or this doctor is not responding timely to our, our employees who are looking to go for care um, to that facility. So then you know you either need to talk to that facility or choose another facility. So it's really a great comprehensive solution. Um, we also have a uh, white paper for self-funding and medical tourism that's available. And participants of today's webcast are available to get that for free. Um, you can uh, either email me or Jamie for it, and we'd be happy to send it to you. So one of the things is um, you know, we have some special uh, benefits for people on the webcast today um, through uh, captive resources that I'd like to uh, tell you about. And one of it is if you're, if you're working for a TPA, an insurance agency, an employer, um, you can you know, receive a free pass um, you know, if you're not in the medical tourism industry now for our World Medical Tourism and Global Healthcare Congress. Um, it's September, September 20th through the 24th in Washington, D.C. It's the only event of its kind in the world. It brings in over 2,200 attendees from 90 different countries. And basically, you can come and sit on sessions on how do you implement medical tourism, whether it's domestic or international, how do you do it successfully. You can talk to other employers who have done it, and then you can come and network with all the hospitals from across the U.S. or around the world where you can actually um, send patients. And it's actually integrated with the Employer Healthcare and Benefits Congress, so you can also jump into sessions on corporate wellness and self-funding and healthcare reform. Um, so there, you can do networking meetings. There's networking software, so you can look who's in the system and actually go connect with them. Um, you know, we're going to have about 200 speakers this year, um, and the pass is typically about uh, ranges from $1,500 to $2,500, depending on the time of year. Um, so the pass, if you're you know an HR manager or working as an insurance agency or broker or TPA, um, it's free, and you can use the code GO uh, MTVIP. So it's G O M T V. MTVIP, the MTV, and it threw me off like the TV station. Um, so, and you can do that on uh, MTC, uh, I'm sorry, mtcongress.com or um, medicaltourismcongress.com. And then if you don't qualify for that free pass, um, or, or actually if you are an HR professional, TPA, reinsurer, and you actually want to do medical tourism, but you want to get certified in it, um, we, you can get, uh, we have a special offer of becoming a certified medical tourism professional for $9.95, and that's typically, um, you know, $1,500 online, or if you did it at the conference, it could be up to $3,500. So you save a couple thousand dollars, and then you go through best practices and standards and how you implement it, get tested, get it, go through an exam, and get an actual designation. And that code is VIP Get Cert. Um, so with that, I would love to turn it back over to Jamie for um, any questions she'd like to ask. Um, and uh, I, uh, you know, this webcast will be available for uh, everyone afterwards via video. Excellent. Thank you all so much. And Jonathan, thank you so much. This was excellent and just exactly what I was expecting, and it's perfect. So thank you. The first question that we have, and we we got quite a few of these coming through, is um, will we be able to um, disseminate the actual presentation, the presentation slides, to either members or anybody who was on the webcast today? Yes, yes. So our, our um, media manager is going to convert it into a video format, and then he'll send it out. And I'm, I'm guessing that'll 
um, probably go out Monday um, once he gets it uh, converted. Perfect. Okay, next question that I have is, this is a question um, regarding, can you please educate us on insurance for medical tourism facilitators? Ah, that is a great, uh, that is an excellent question. Um, and so medical, yeah, so there is medical tourism insurance um, for self-funded plans. And what I mean by that is you can buy um, complication insurance that covers you in the event there's a complication. Um, and, um, and so for that, you can, you can basically eliminate some of your risk of worrying if a complication happens. So obviously if a complication happens overseas, it's still going to be 90% less. Um, then the complication would happen here in the U.S. And I think we, you know, this is medical care. So complications are going to happen. Um, you know, there is no, um, you know, there's no, uh, you know, there's no way to say there isn't going to be complications. But by partnering with the best hospital and the best surgeon, you're really going to eliminate most of your complications. Um, and um, we have a member of our, uh, our association who uh, provides that complication insurance. So if, um, you know, if anyone uh, on this call uh, would l like more information on it, we'll send it uh, to you. And then, Jamie, what I'll also do is I'll provide you that information that you can provide out when you send out the PowerPoint so people can, who are interested in medical tourism can also contact that company and, and look at what their policies uh, cover. Perfect. Next question that came through is, can you discuss the, re the requirement of first dollar coverage in health plans and how employers are passing this cost on to the employees. And they said if you can um, use specifically uh, the Walmart example as possible. Um, well, how, how they're passing, you said, first dollar coverage on to the employee. Because in Walmart's case, if someone's traveling for, you know, the domestic medical tourism, that employee pays nothing. They're eliminating all the expenses the employee would have to pay. So they're saying you don't have any first dollar expenses, there's no copay, there's no deductible, there's no co-insurance, you don't have to pay for airfare, or for hotel, for food, anything. We're covering 100% of it because we know that the quality is going to be so good that our costs are going to be less and you're going to return to work faster. Excellent. Next question. Um, I'm wondering what you're seeing in the private sector with regards to national surgical networks, which deliver quality as well as savings to self-funded employers. They're looking at this um, or asking this in regards um, specifically to domestic medical tourism. Yeah, there are some excellent networks out there that are doing domestic medical tourism and have national networks of doctors and hospitals put together. Um, you know, and if anyone wants to email me afterwards, I'd, I'd be happy to send them some emails of who those companies are, um, meaning that if you're, you're a self-funded plan and you're looking at doing domestic medical tourism, this isn't something you need to start from scratch and go contract directly with the hospitals. And, and there really is two ways to do it. So some hospitals um, do employer direct contracting. Um, so Lowe's did it, Pepsi did it, Walmart did it, and that's where you go to the hospital and you negotiate a contract directly with that facility. But that's, that, you know, that's a Walmart. You know, that, that, those are the big employers. That's not necessarily easy to do, and it's a very lengthy process. So you can kind of leapfrog ahead by partnering with a company that has already a national network and doing domestic medical tourism, where it's just like adding another PPO network, um, and, it's, and it's a turnkey solution. And I would really recommend that, because the other part is, if you're doing medical tourism, whether it's domestic or international, you really need what's called a facilitator or that middleman organization who's going to put all the pieces of the puzzle together for you and, more importantly, coordinate amongst your employees and provide customer service to your employees. Because when someone's traveling for care, you have to handhold them. You've got to help them with travel, um, you know, with hotel. Um, you have to walk them through the whole process. And on the international side, there's even more hand-holding. So you really um, want someone there who's a trusted resource in between who, who can really provide a lot of those services so that there's consistent positive outcomes and experiences. Mm -hmm. And then along with that, I think it's important that you make sure that you're, in, uh, that you're working with a hospital that has you know, an international patient department or domestic medical tourism department 
and has the services and standards and best practices in place to actually you know, treat um, traveling patients. Because not all of them do, and some say they do. Um, but if they, if they don't have the right services in place, there's going to be bad, um, bad customer experiences. Not quality, but the experience. And then the reality is from a patient perspective, that patient experience determines and reflects upon the quality. So if they have bad customer service, then they're going to equate that to the quality wasn't good. So it's important to make sure they really have an excellent international patient department in place. Excellent. So kind of to piggyback off of, um, off of that as well, what size company is a good target size for medical tourism? Are there smaller companies using this? Um, because some, uh, they asked because all of your examples were bigger, larger companies such as, you know, Walmart, Lowe's, PepsiCo. I think, you know, uh, you know, this can, you know, I know we're seeing a lot of creative self-funded plans, even going down to 10 to 15 lives. I think this type of plan is perfect for any size employer. And the reality is the smaller you get, even, you know, the bigger of an impact it has. Because if you have only 100 employees, um, that one, if you get a $100,000 claim and your stock up deductible is $100,000, that can really, you know, that can hurt your whole plan for the year. Um, and those are the type of, of uh, employers where those savings have a much bigger impact. Um, so I would really say, you know, there really is no good size any, anymore. I think, you know, er everyone who has it should have it. The larger employers, you know, they'll see um, more substantial savings because of the volume, but the smaller employers are, I think, the ones that ha have the biggest concern with budgeting, and that's where it makes a huge difference. And then the next question I, um, somebody had was, how would a company begin to choose national or international facilities to partner with, assuming that we've had no past experience? I would recommend they contact um, you know, us, the Medical Tourism Association. We're the global nonprofit for the industry. Um, and you know, we really advocate that you work with our members, because our, our members are really committed to best practices and standards in the industry. Um, and, you know, and that's one of the ways that you can really make sure that you're getting a positive uh, outcome because there are, you know, I'm, I'm not going to sugarcoat it, just like any other profession or even here in the U.S. where there's great hospitals, average hospitals, and bad hospitals, you have the same in the U.S. and overseas. And then, at, you know, when I was mentioning those medical tourism facilitators who coordinate care, you also have um, the best average and, and poor. And you have, you'll have facilitators, there's one on the news right now, um, who had been in the news consistently in the past on CNN and others in a very positive way. Um, but uh, they were just on uh, Al Jazeera and some others for stealing money from, um, from uh, uh, patients, and specifically U.S. patients. So uh, taking money from them and not delivering the surgeries and some other issues. Um, and there's actually um, one of the biggest stop-loss carriers here in the U.S., their medical tourism uh, facilitator partner was featured in multiple news stories, including the Hartford Current, um, for being um, or having to pay fifty million dollars in restitution to doctors and spend and being sentenced to five years in federal prison. Um, and I'm saying this not to scare people, um, but to actually be very careful as to who you partner with, because there are great companies in, in here and in this industry. Um, but you need to find the right partner. And don't just assume, because your, your reinsurance carrier or stop-loss company says, we recommend this company, um, that they're a good company. So I always recommend, you know, just reach out and drop me an email and say, hey, you know, you know do you recommend a company or what do you think about this company? And we'd be happy to, uh, to share, that with, share that with you. Because at the end of the day, you want a consistent, positive experience, and this is really a long-term program that you want to put in place. You want to find a long-term partner that's going to be around for the long haul. Great answer. And we have two more questions, if you have time to take them. Um, the question is, where can we find templates for liability concerns between the medical facilitator and the patient? And if the employer is self-insured, do you have a copy of the document that must be amended to the plan document? Okay, yes. Yeah. So one of the things is, um, you know, if you're a self-funded TPA employer broker, you know, you can join the MTA as a member. 
Um, if you are become a member, um, then you'll get access to certain things. So we have some sample contracts. Um, we have contract temp, uh, template contract language that you should put in place. So you'll get some of those things, and that can save you thousands of dollars in going to develop them on your own. And then there's also some attorneys um, that specialize in so that we can recommend. So if there's anything specialized that you need to specifically create for your employer, they can sign off on it. And one of the things I didn't mention in this webcast, which probably is one of the most important parts of it, is because self-funded plans are governed by ERISA, you know, some, you know, one of the concerns people have is, well, what happens if we get sued or, there, or there's medical malpractice? Is, you know, all the answers that we've gotten from our legal advisory board is that it's almost impo an impossibility that a TPA reinsurance company, self-funded employer agent, will get sued for medical tourism um, liability because it's, it's, by, um, it's governed by ERISA and it's, it's um, the way ERISA is governed in the court rulings is, you know, it's, it's, you know, there's blatant cases of horrible medical malpractice and the federal court still will never hold, um, hold uh, the claim against the employer so that that is not a concern for self-funded employers. Excellent. And last but not least, um, this is in regards to the rates. Um, are we eligible to take advantage of the special rate if we are an ACA navigator and licensed through the, the Department of Insurance? The answer to that would be yes, as long as you are the navigator and you also don't have some kind of a, a side business in medical tourism. Yes, you would qualify. Um, and really, it's um, you know I, I think that you know if you come to the event, what you're going to basically accomplish is in two to three days, you're going to become you know, one of the top experts in medical tourism because a lot of people haven't delved into this um, and really don't understand it. And it's not something that you can just pick up overnight or read an article. So to sit in those sessions for two to three days by some of the top national and international experts and to network and build relationships with some of these hospitals, I think you'll be years ahead of, the, uh, ahead of your competition. Excellent. Those are all the questions that we have for the session today. I just wanted to again thank you Jonathan and the Medical Tourism or yeah Medical Tourism Association for partnering with us for this special event. To all of the Well Health Insurance members out there, thank you again for joining. Um, the documents will be or the uh, link to this webinar will be on the Well Health Insurance website for the members. Um, for anybody else who is participating as members of MTA um, or um, Perspective members, um, we will make sure that you also get the, the uh, webinar link as well for the recording. So again, I thank you all for your time today. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me, Jamie Feinberg, or again to Jonathan. Um, again, thank you and have a great day.